Salon Kitty was a high-class brothel in Berlin set up by the National Socialist Security Services, the SD, during World War II. In this video you can see where it was in the Berlin district of Charlottenburg. The building and street to a large extent look today as they would have done then. Salon Kitty was located on the third floor. Unfortunately, on the day of my visit, there was a lot of scaffolding outside, so we can't see the building very clearly. What went on in Salon Kitty in Berlin during the war is largely left to the imagination. There are so many stories, it is difficult to sift through what is true and what isn't. Reinhard Heydrich and Walter Schellenberg had vivid imaginations and after the war Schellenberg's memoirs appear to be more of a novel than reality. I need to point out that there's no archival evidence that I am aware of for this story but there is physical proof as well as the recollections of one lady who worked there. One person, however, did claim there was archival evidence. Novelist Peter Norden published a fact report in 1970. The intimate conversations between the ladies who worked in Salon Kitty and their clients were recorded on wax plates in the elaborately wired basement, and according to Norden, thousands of them were under strict supervision and control of East Germany's state security service. That was easy enough to say in 1970, but since then East Germany has become a bad memory and no trace of the supposedly unique archive has surfaced, neither surviving wax plates nor any records of their existence, not even lumps of wax. Even in the thousands of sacks of destroyed Stasi files, there's nothing that indicates the existence of such a stock. Of course, Norden could not have expected the DDR to crumble so quickly, and this rather spoiled his story. However, there were problems with Norden's story even in 1970. Each wax sheet of the type used in the early 1940s held four and a half to five minutes of recording at very most. So the wiretapping experts would have had to put on dozens of records during every hour visit. And even if the Gestapo had used the magnetic tape recorders, which had only just been introduced in 1938, the Gestapo officials would have been forced to change the tapes three times an hour. Then the maximum recording time was 22 minutes per 1,000 meter tape. So a one hour visit to the brothel would have required almost three kilometers of magnetic tape per guest. However, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's start at the beginning. Kitty was the nickname of the future madam and brothel owner, Kitchen Emma Sophie Schmidt. She was born in Hamburg on the 25th of June 1882 as the second eldest daughter of the merchant Johannes Andreas Theodor Schmidt and his wife Emma. As a young woman, Kitty went to the United Kingdom as a piano teacher. According to her grandson, Joachim Mate, she met a great love there, a Spanish consul named Zamit, whom she married, but he later took his own life with a gun. On the 15th of October 1906, their daughter Kathleen was born in Cardiff. Presumably, Kitty returned to Germany after the end of the First World War. She settled in Berlin with her daughter. In 1922, she went into business at Budapest de Strasse 27 with her first brothel. The law in the Weimar Republic was quite lax, and in any case, this was Berlin in the 1920s, where anything went. In 1935, she sought out new accommodation, which she disguised as a boarding house at Kurfürstendamm 63. And in 1939, she went to Giesebergstrasse 11, which is very close. The upscale clientele corresponded to the exclusive location of well-known public figures, foreign diplomats and high-ranking officials of the National Socialist regime were apparently among the customer base. The idea of opening or converting a brothel for espionage purposes is said to have come from Reinhard Heydrich, who was then the head of the security police and the security service, the SD. At least that's what SD Foreign Chief Walter Schellenberg claims in his memoirs published in 1959. It was these memoirs that mentioned Salah and Kitty by name for the first time. Heydrich may have been inspired by his fondness for British spy novels, which in some impressed Heinrich Himmler when he applied for a job with the SD in 1932. Heydrich commissioned Schellenberg with the planning, and Schellenberg wrote in his memoirs, 
So I set about renting a suitable house using a front. Double walls, modern listening devices and automatic long distance transmission ensured that every word spoken in this salon was recorded and transmitted to a control centre. The technical maintenance was the responsibility of officers sworn to secrecy of the security service. The domestic staff from the maid to the waiter consisted of secret agents. It is disputed whether Kitty Schmidt was forced to cooperate or whether she made her house available voluntarily. One story is that Kitty was attempting to escape from Germany and she was caught. Schellenberg then gave her a choice, open a brothel for us or be forced into doing something less agreeable. Wilhelm Canaris, the head of the Abwehr and private friend of Heydrich, is said to have mentioned to one of his agents that the Gestapo operated tape recorders and a bugging system in the basement of the salon, but at the same time expressed moral and practical concerns. Firstly, as an officer, I cannot reconcile counterintelligence with a brothel, and secondly, I cannot imagine that a diplomat enjoying one of the girls, then taking a break, chattering about the most secret marching in and marching out plans and then returns to whatever he was doing before uh, for a second time. I share the opinion of Canaris. I think the idea that someone who'd access the secrets is hardly likely to tell some ladies just met in a brothel, or maybe I'm just being too naive about such matters. However, proof does exist that something was going on there. During renovation work in the 1960s, sockets and cables were found in a 12 square metre basement room that ran from the basement to the third floor. Little is known about the women who worked in Kitty's salon. In 2004, an anonymous interview was given to a German television where the lady stated that she was vigorously questioned on her attitude to Hitler. Only one name of a lady who worked there is known, that of Liesel Ackermann from berlin Schoenberg, who worked there from 1940 to 1945. She commented on her work in a Spiegel interview from 1976, at the time when the Italian film called Salon Kitty came out. Liesl had previously worked in brothels but as a waitress and maid. One day, someone from the police vice squad gave her a choice of working in armaments production or for Kitty. Liesl could stay at home, but she was on standby, so to speak, and was usually called to work by telephone twice a day. In the very cultivated atmosphere of the salon, people initially ate and drank in moderation. The only alcohol was sparkling wine. And then the other thing happened. Condoms were a sine qua non and the service cost 200 marks. To put this into comparison, this is roughly what an industrial worker would earn in one month at the time. So she fought on the home front, so to speak. She looked after important men. She fondly remembers the Reich Sportführer von Schammer und Osten. He was so small and had a crippled hand. Colonel General Fromm was a giant, she said. In this photograph, we can see both of them with British Ambassador Neville Henderson in the middle. I'm, of course, unable to say if they are discussing what was going on at Salon Kitty. Another gentleman who used to like to visit was Mussolini's son-in-law, Count Galeazzo Ciano, who, during the proceedings, didn't like to take off his black socks. One client was a nobleman of Silesian blood, a Count Hochberg, a fat little man with a red face. He visited every Wednesday at 12 for years and she could also discuss the political situation with him because he worked in a Gestapo office in an important position and was clearly unhappy about it. One day he had a nervous breakdown and cried. A Polish foreign worker was having an affair with a German woman and the Count had to sign his death warrant. So he asked Adolf to let him go to the front, but Adolf refused. The Count gave his liesel who didn't yet have a driving license, a car. I could have got a manor which they'd confiscated in Poland straight away, she said. She didn't want to marry, though. I was a commoner, after all. And what use is a manor to me, I thought. We're going to lose the war anyway. From this description given in the 1976 interview, I've been unable to trace who the Count may have been. The qualifications required for this type of work were to be intelligent, multilingual, and national socialist minded. Kitty Schmidt valued style and class, not only in clothes, but also in manners. Usually only a few ladies were available on the premises. Others were pictured in albums and could be summoned by telephone if needed. Using the code word, I come from Rottenburg, clients could have access to ladies in the album. 
Their role was to loosen the tongues of the clients with alcohol and physical exertion and thus elicit information from them. According to Walter Schellenberg, Salon Kitty provided excellent information. However, he doesn't give one single example of the excellent information received. Apparently, it was an open secret amongst the visitors that all conversations were bugged and recorded. Count Galeazzo Ciano told his interpreter, Eugen Dolman, Heydrich must be very stupid if he thinks I don't know about this gentleman in the next room. He should hide his microphones more carefully. Other prominent guests and clients at Salon Kitty included the head of the Leibstrand data Adolf Hitler, Sepp Dietrich, Reich Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and Nazi Party Reich organisation leader Robert Ley. Josef Goebbels probably popped in too when no starlets were available free of charge. Frequent visitors were also Heydrich and Schellenberg, which brings me neatly onto the point of the brothel. I think that these two set the whole thing up for themselves, a place they could go for a freebie at the taxpayer's expense. Both of them were noted for nights on the town, indeed in the 1920s when Heydrich had been in the Navy. According to his shipmates, he used to spend a lot of time visiting such institutions at ports of call. Only then he was a foreign sailor and he had to pay for the services received. Now he was head of the SD and one of the most feared men in the Third Reich. Heydrich and Schellerburn also used to go out drinking together until the small hours. To make it even more interesting, Schellenberg was sleeping with Heydrich's wife. One day, Heydrich told Schellenberg that he'd poisoned his drink and would only give him the antidote after a full confession from him. As his wife had already told Heydrich of what she and Schellenberg were getting up to, then Heydrich probably just wanted confirmation. In 1943, the building was damaged in an air raid. The business was moved to the ground floor, and after that, the Reich Security Main Office quickly lost interest. By this time, Heydrich was dead. The journalist and author Klaus Harprecht described in his memoirs a conversation with Kitty Schmidt shortly before her death in 1954. She said that the listening devices with the experts were housed downstairs in the basement and that every room was covered with tiny microphones and the young ladies knew about what was going on. She knew the tastes of all her important guests, including those of her hosts. However, as we've seen, Liesl Ackerman clearly did not know about the bugs. After the end of the Second World War, Kitty Schmidt continued to operate under the name Pension Schmidt, partly as a guest house and partly as a brothel. After her death in 1954, her daughter Kathleen Maté ran the business as Pension Florian until the 1980s, followed by her grandson Joachim Maté until 1992. In the early 1990s, however, business wasn't doing very well, and so the grandson of Kitty Schmidt converted the brothel into a boarding house for asylum seekers. After protests from local residents, however, it soon had to close. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much for watching. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours my time. I'm normally based in Poland and in Germany, and that's where these videos are coming from. If this is the sort of thing you're interested in, then you might want to subscribe. For the moment, all the best from me in Poland.